To someone new to shops, workbenches look like nothing more than tables that raise what we're working on off the floor. If I took my workbench and put it in a kitchen, a culinary dropout could easily make do with it. But with woodworking, having a raised surface is only fractionally as important as the method to hold the stock we are working on. If you've ever needed to break down a long board with a handsaw, you'll know immediately what I'm talking about. Today, we're gonna go back in time and rediscover the bench hook. With a little luck, we're going to see if we can improve it or just overcomplicate a simple idea. The first recorded definition of a bench hook was by Joseph Moxon of the Moxon Vice fame in his Mechanic Exercises book written in the 17th century. His vision of a bench hook is what we now term as a bench dog, which is a peg that fits in the table that stock rests up against. If you do a quick search on the silky interwebs, you can see that there are many different commercial varieties of this simple hook, but usually it works in conjunction with a vise and clamps to the edge of the boards, leaving the face untouched. Unlike using an F-clamp, this gives unimpeded access to the surface, allowing one to easily do things such as flattening and leveling or planing the surface. From that time until the early 19th century, the whereabouts of the bench hook term becomes murky. Peter Nicholson, who studied Moxon's work, published his own mechanical exercises book in 1812. In it, he used the same descriptors that Moxon used for a bench hook. Interestingly enough, he has the first recorded drawing of what he called a side hook, which is the design we know as the bench hook. In his description of the use of the side hook, he describes it as a tool used to cut the shoulders of tenons. Here I've got a 19th century style bench or side hook. These types of hooks were generally made in pairs as they were made to work in tandem with each other. Because they are so narrow, you need a second one to balance your stock and keep it off the surface as you cut. If you're interested in creating one, they're very simple to create and can be made with two two by threes that are 12 inches long. I left two inch hooks on the end. It does look very similar to an S. In Nicholson's description of the side hook, they weren't meant to be used to cut lumber to size, but rather to cut shoulders. With this tenon I'm cutting, using the hook allows me to hold my stock as I work the blade down. But let's quickly look at how these work. Bench hooks are simple devices that work with forward force that you apply as you work with the stock. Each bench hook has three different layers. The bottom layer obviously hooks onto the bench, the middle layer, which is what our stock lies on, and the top layer is the hook that catches the back edge of our stock. What's great about these very easy to create devices is that they can hook onto any surface of the shop. Of course, with the 19th century version of the bench hook, you'll want to add something to the surface so that you don't damage it. Obviously, the biggest problem and possibly why these weren't ideal for cutting stock to size was the damage that they did to the bench top. No matter how hard you try, you can't stop the blade after the final pass has been made from cutting the surface. With the bench being such an integral part of the woodworking process, in the time before we had machines to cut and form stock to size, preserving the surface was just as important as preventing rust from forming on machine tabletops. In the 20th century, we find a more modern method to creating this hook. Instead of using a single board and creating three surfaces, methods to creating these are used by joinery such as dowels, rabbits, and butt joints. In addition to these designs, adding a gap at the end of the top layer allowed making a cut without sacrificing the surface below. In Myron Burton's Shop Projects Based on Community Problems, written in 1915, we see that the term bench hook shifted from the pegs and catches on the surface to a fatter version of the side hook. In the book, Burton writes, The proper use of the bench hook will prevent sawing the top or mooring it with a chisel, for this bench hook is made wide enough to provide a good surface on which to do chiseling. It also goes on to further explain the added gap. The bench hook shown in this lesson provides the sawing space on the right-hand side. If the hook is to be used by a left-handed person, the block should be set on such a way as to leave the sawing margin on the left-hand side of the bench hook. A bench hook can be made with one right and one left-hand side. Simplicity is the woodworker's best companion as it makes troubleshooting problems easier. This design couldn't be much simpler and it works. But there is a slight flaw to this design. Western saws, like the back saw, use frontward force to cut. This frontward force works really well with these bench hooks as you're forcing the wood against the back edge of the hook. But if you've gotten used to the slightly more delicate and what I think is more precise nature of the Japanese style pull saws, like I have, they're a bit cumbersome. I'm really having a hard time holding this against the back plate, but that shouldn't be a surprise as Japanese pull saws work in a pulling motion. I can put all my energy against the stock, but I'm working against physics. So I came up with a different take on this. 
Instead of using the edge of the bench, I look more at a three quarter inch hole to keep my hook from moving. This means that I can use either a push or pull saw and not have to worry about the force needed to keep the jig on the table. The physics of the bench hook are very simple. When you push forward, you're pushing the stock against the back of the hook, but there's those few times where the blade will catch and pull back. The hole I estimated would keep things fluid without having to worry about holding the hook on the table. I can focus more attention into cutting straight. Originally, I had planned on using metal brackets on the edge and using a knob to lock it against the table side. While this would work, it would have complicated the very simple nature of the bench hook. Next, I took the simplicity route and thought I'd split the table in two parts, with a fence right down the middle. To hollow out the center, I used a table saw and set my depth to 3 8 for a 3 quarter inch plywood. Afterwards, I added a 3 quarter inch dowel in the center on one of the ends. When it was all done, it seemed to work except it pivoted on the dowel when I made cuts again causing me to focus on balancing and movement. There was still another problem that came with this design. After making this larger hook, I didn't like this compact size. I had roughly four inches of width and it didn't feel like enough. Another more minor issue with the design was how far forward I would need to hold my stock when I used the pull saw. So I scrapped the design again and focused my attention on why my board was shifting with the cut. Once I found this out, I could focus on the actual design. If the motion of either pulling or pushing was causing it to rock, I rationalized that putting the dowel on the end where the force was being created would help balance out the movement. And it worked. With the motion solved, I turned to the design. If I put the fence closer to one edge, I would have more space for my pull saw. Rotating the board, I could use the added space for the back saw. This, of course, means a dual hole system. Because I didn't want to worry about wearing out each of the holes by removing a dowel each time, I switched to a three quarter inch bolt. And this is the end result of the madness. This bench hook does everything that the 19th century side hook was designed to do, as well as the 20th century misnomer that we have come to believe is the bench hook. Besides being able to use a back saw, the more delicate and precise nature of a pull saw can easily be achieved. Instead of using a sawing margin that Meyer and Burton wrote about, I stretched the fence to the edges and created a curve that gives me 90 degree cuts. And since these types of fences eventually get chewed up in time, I attached the fence with a single screw that would allow me to replace it later on. I also added a ruler to quickly add marks to the stock I want to cut. If you're worried about chewing up the surface, a piece of scrap wood will preserve it. A second block, the thickness of the body can be added for longer boards. Best of all, this guy is compact, yet maximizes the space that it takes up. It, along with the riser and the scrap wood, easily attached under my bench and out of the way, something that would have been difficult for either the side hook or the 20th century bench hook. Space is premium in my shop. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you got something out of this. If you're interested in my designs, I've got more detailed step-by-step -step instructions on my website that are free. I have that link in the description. I couldn't do this without my patrons. Thank you. Michelle B, Keith Current, William L. McNally, Jerry Adams, Tommy QR, Zach Finch, Rich Lightfoot, and Tudor the Barbarian. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that bell. And I thank you so much for being a part of my shop. Please leave a comment below. Come find me on Instagram at Makings with Rob. And remember to keep making things.